This conference will now be recorded. Uh, hello, everyone. Hope you are studying well and everything is going great. Uh, today, inshallah, we'll discuss uh, three important topics related to the gynecological problem. And first, uh, clean top guideline is about management of ovarian system perimenopausal women and Second is about postmenopausal women, and the last one is about the long-term consequence polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I hope, inshallah, to finish uh, this three in times. The first uh, guideline is green top guideline about the management of suspected ovarian masses in perimenopausal women. This is uh, 2011. Up to 10% women will have some form of surgery from for the presence of ovarian masses. So it's about up to 10% of women have surgery related to the ovarian masses. This is big figures, so an important figure because this is came in exam it's as SPA discuss about the women have uh, surgery for the presence of the ovarian masses. So remember, it's about up to 10% of women will have some form of surgery for the presence of the ovarian masses. This is the SPA. And in perimenopausal women, almost all ovarian masses are and cysts are benign. So it is good, it is in age of reproductive age, or in perimenopausal women, most of almost all the ovarian masses are and cysts are benign. What about the incidence of asymptomatic ovarian uh, cyst? So here is different between perimenopausal and postmenopausal. So the overall incidence of asymptomatic ovarian cyst in perimenopausal female being malignant is approximately one per 1,000, increasing to three per 1,000 as the age of 50. This is in so here, the incidence of asymptomatic ovarian cyst in perimenopausal being malignant is one per 1,000, and increasing up to three per 1,000 at the age of 50. So it's in perimenopausal, the incidence of malignant in case of asymptomatic ovarian cyst is about one per 1,000, and in postmenopausal women is three per 1,000. This is SP on and also the call quitch. And this is very important, but you should remember uh, these figures, okay? The preoperative differentiated between penine and malignant cyst can be problematic with no test of occurrence, except for germ cell tumor with elevation of BHCG and alpha fetoprotein. So here, very difficult to differentiate by testing uh, from prion and malignant cyst. So except in case of germ cell tumor, you can differentiate it by the uh, tumor marker, BHCG and alpha fetoprotein. 10% of suspected ovarian masses were found to, to be non-ovarian in origin. So it's about 10% of suspected ovarian masses may be uh, not non-ovarian in origin. So here, remember, these two important figures is up to 10% of women have some form of the surgery related to the ovarian masses, and 10% of suspected ovarian masses were found to be non-ovarian in origin. How to minimize the patient morbidity in patient with ovarian 
cyst how to minimize the patient morbidity this about five way to to minimize the patient morbidity in in management of the ovarian cyst in perimenopausal women the first one is conservative management where possible so first line here is the conservative management why conservative management because most of the cyst here is benign and may be functional or simple ovarian cyst so can be treated conservatively okay so the first one is conservative management where it's possible and the definition of the functional or simple ovarian cyst if the cyst have seen wall cyst without internal structure which are less than 50 millimeter maximum diameter usually resolve over two to three menstrual cycle without the need for intervention that is why we uh, said the conservative minute is important because this cyst may be resolved over two to three menstrual cycle without need for intervention second one is the use of laparoscopic technique where possible to avoid laparotomy where possible because here we prefer to use laparoscopic technique in surgery rather than laparotomy because labor laparoscopic approach is considered to be the gold standard for the management of benign ovarian masses so the choice here for surgery here the laparoscopic is preferable rather than laparotomy and third one is mini laparotomy may be considered for occasional very large cyst so if these have very large, large cyst you can do mini laparotomy and a rare occasion the laparoscopic approach may be specifically contraindicated in individual patients so we can do mini laparotomy and the last one is to minimize the uh, to minimize the patient morbidity is refer referral to gynecological oncologist way appropriate so this is the five way to minimize the patient morbidity in case of ovarian cyst in very minimal so where we said the conservative management and the use of laparoscopic technique and mini laparotomy and on their occasion you can uh, use laparoscopic approach may be specifically contraindicated in individual patient and the last one is the referral to gynecological oncologist where possible this is about the five way for minimize patient morbidity is it clear here here the table shows the type of adenexial masses here is about four types either benign ovarian masses or benign non ovarian because we said about 10 percent it is non ovarian origin and primary malignant ovarian basically you know about the germ cell tumor epithelial carcinoma six core tumors and secondary malignant ovarian predominantly press and gastrostinal carcinoma this is about type of adenexial mass what about the preoperative assessment of women with ovarian masses so how to assess patient preoperatively have ovarian masses so we'll start first with the history and clinical examination so also of the this medical history with specific attention to the risk factor or protective factor for ovarian malignancy so in medical history the aim of the medical history is to attention for the risk factor of ovarian cancer the risk factor of the ovarian cancer and the protective factors for ovarian cancer so what is the risk factor of ovarian cancer what is the what is the risk factor of ovarian cancer 
Hello? Anybody knows? And what is the protective factor for the ovarian malignancy? So here in the medical history, look for the attention for the risk factor and protective factor. So a family history of ovarian and breast cancer. So also ask about the family history of ovarian or the breast cancer and about the symptom of suggestive endometriosis. Ask about the symptom suggestive of endometriosis and symptom suggestive of ovarian malignancy. As example, persistent abdominal distension. If there's any change in appetite, pelvic and abdominal pain, increased urinary frequency and urgent. This is the symptom of ovarian malignancy. Maybe ovarian malignancy present with these symptoms. Careful physical examination is essential. So examination here is very important to examine the abdomen and vaginal examination and the presence of local lymph adenomyosis. So here, in case of ovarian or suspected ovarian masses, you should do abdominal examination. And also there's vaginal examination and if there's any local lymph adenomyosis. In acute presentation with pain, so if there's any patient present with acute emergence or acute presentation with pain, consider ovarian incidence diagnosis as ovarian torsion or ovarian cyst structure or hemorrhagic cyst. So this is the recall question. Many the Exam, many questions came in exam asking about the ovarian torsion, pre rupture, ovarian hemorrhagic cyst. So if there's any acute presentation, if any severe pain with case of ovarian cyst, you should consider. But in your mind, there may be other causes, maybe ovarian cyst torsion or rupture or hemorrhagic because a lot of questions came in exam uh, asking about the ovarian torsion. You give you a scenario of the patient of acute pain and you give you option. This is uh, most of cases about ovarian torsion. How to diagnose the ovarian masses in in the premenopausal woman. So first we'll do blood test after history of examination. The next step is the blood, do blood test. A serum CA-125 SA does not need to be undertaken in all perimenopausal women when ultrasound diagnosis of simple ovarian cyst has been made. Here is different in case of postmenopausal. So in, in case of perimenopausal woman, if you do ultrasound and you find this is simple ovarian cyst, no need to do serum CA125. So this is very important point. Because CA125 plays in numerous conditions, including fibroid and endometriosis and adenomyosis and pelvic infection. So that is why be careful about the high level of CA125 in case of perimenopausal woman, because it is less in numerous condition like fibroid, endometriosis, and adenomyosis and pelvic infection. So consequently, a raised level a serum CA125 should be interpreted cautiously. Okay. In if a serum CA125 assay is raised and less than 200 units per mil, further investigation may be appropriate to exclude and treat the common differential diagnosis. So here, CA125 may be have benefit in differential diagnosis. So if less than 200 units per mil, so we need to look for the other causes or differential diagnosis.
where serum CA125 level are raised, serial monitoring of CA125 may be helpful as rapidly rising level are more likely to be associated with malignance than high level which remain static. So we need here if the you find CA125 is high or raised, you need to do serial monitoring for CM, uh, CA125 because maybe if this is rapidly rising, this is may give clue about the malignance rather than if it remain static. So if you find C125 is high, is raised, you should do serial monitoring because maybe if there is rapidly rising level, maybe more likely to be associated with malignance rather than remain static. If serum CA125 is a more than 200 unit mL per mL, discussion is gynecological oncologist is recommended. Here, if more than 200, you should discuss this with the specialist, so gynecological oncologist. And we said before, if less than 200 unit per mL, we need to look for the other differential diagnosis. If more than 200 units per mil, so this is high, maybe uh, this risk of malignance, so we need to discuss with the gynecological oncologist about this case. CA125 is primarily a marker for epithelial ovarian carcinoma and is the only risk in 50% of early stage disease. So because this is CA125 is very important in diagnosis of epithelial ovarian carcinoma, but is only raised in 50% of early stage of the disease. We said before, CA125 may be raised in numerous conditions like PID, fibroid, endometriosis, and other, and may be reduced if this Cavinitech, strectomy, and smoking. And here is the CA125 increase in maybe in acute event in benign cyst uh, in case of hemorrhagic ovarian cyst or the ovarian torsion. Or in benign non gynecological condition that cause peritoneal irritation like tuberculosis, cirrhosis, ascites, hepatitis, pancreatitis, peritonitis, and pleuritis. And primary tumor metastasis to peritoneum, like breast cancer, pancreas, lung, and colon cancer. This is, CA125 is increased in this disease. What about the role of ultrasound assessment of suspected ovarian masses? So perfect ultrasound is the single most effective way of evaluating ovarian masses. So this is very important symptom, a very important point. Pelvic ultrasound is the single most effective way. So this is the first line of investigation. You should start by pelvic ultrasound. And transvaginal ultrasound is preferable due to increased sensitivity over trans abdomen. So the first investigation for ovarian is ultrasound. We prefer to do transvaginal ultrasound. Here no role for Doppler mapping. But in combined use of transvaginal ultrasound and color flow Doppler mapping and three-dimensional scanning may improve sensitivity, particularly in complex must. So here, the ultrasound is the first line of investigation, and you prefer prefer transvaginal ultrasound over transabdominal ultrasound. So, how to calculate the malignance, and what is the best way to estimate the risk of malignance? So estimation of the risk of malignant is essential in 
assessment of the ovarian mass. So here, the MRI, RMI, risk of malignant index, is the most widely unused model as the best one to estimate the risk of malignancy. And the second one is the ultrasound rule David from the International Ovarian Tumor Analysis to our crops have increased sensitivity and specificity. But here we suppress one to estimate the risk of malignance is the RMI. So we'll discuss this in the next slide. What does it mean by MRI? We'll discuss in also in the postmenopausal woman, because it's important rather than premenopausal. Here we have three important things in uh, risk of malignant index. So, uh, as we mentioned, risk of malignant index is the best way to estimate the risk of malignancy. So, how do you calculate the MRI? RMI. So, you, you should take a score from ultrasound and take a score from the menopausal status and take a score from the CA125. So you should estimate the three score from this three, ultrasound, menopausal, and CA125. Okay? Ultrasound score, if ultrasound is zero for give her a score zero. Ultrasound is nothing or zero, give a score for zero. If ultrasound give one of the criteria of these five criteria, molecular and metastasis and bilateral ascites and solid area. If you found one of this, you give the score one for ultrasound. If you found three of this, like multiocular, and or metastasis or bilateral or ascites or C if C of this we give a score two we give three sorry score three if you find two two to five if you found two or three or four or five of this we give a score three so this is for ultrasound zero zero one one three give a score three for ultrasound if you find Two of two of uh, at least two of this criteria. For mini boss, similarly, like ultrasound, give if the patient is post mini give has the score three. And patient is in pre mini give has score one. So it depends on mini boss status. Is post mini give a score three. Perimenopausal give score. So, and score for the level of CA125. So, what is the definition of post menopause of the menopause? Anybody knows about the menopause, definition of menopause, or the cut point of the menopause? Hello. Hello, Dr. Firth. How are you doing? Hello, Dr. Bushby. How are you? Bye. Yeah, happy Teachers Day, Doctor Fath. Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, menopause is cessation of period year? for uh, one year. No period for one year. <laughs> yes, if there is no period for one more than one years, or the woman over the fifty uh, who had structure, because if there is no period for more than one year, or women have more than 50 who had hysterectomy. So this is the definition of menopause. And average age is the 50, okay? Thank you, Dr. Bushby. So because this is uh, have, uh, this is the important point, and this is the recall question. Many of the question in the in exam asking about the risk of malignant index, how to calculate the risk of malignant index. So this is, uh, SP also in the February 2020. So also CA125, serum CA125 is measured in 
international unit per mil and can vary between zero to thousand or even thousand of units. So this is about how to calculate RMI. Here is about other groups, symbol ultrasound rule here, yeah, divine as P9 rule and malignant rules. So this unit local cyst is P9 rule and if there is present of solid component uh, where the largest solid component is more than seven millimeters or the present of plastic shadowing or a smooth multiocular tumor with largest diameter less than 100 millimeters and no blood flow on color doubler. So this is a benign feature or benign rule by ultrasound. Malignant rules here, if there's irregular, irregular solid tumors or if there's ascites or at least poor papillary structure, if there's irregular multiocular solid tumor with largest diameter more than 100 millimeters, or there's prominent blood flow on color problem ultrasound. But the most important one and the best way to estimate the risk of malignant is the RMI, risk of malignant index. Here we finish the investigation. Now we talk about the management of ovarian masses is very simple and remember this, okay? If there is sim small, simple ovarian cyst less than 50 millimeter diameter, do not wear a follow-up as the cyst is very likely to be physiological and almost always resolved with in three menstrual cycle. So you should measure the ovarian cyst. If, if ultrasound shows this is the symbol, it is very important symbol. So look, this is the symbol or this is complex. Okay, for impatient, impatient of symbol ovarian cyst and the diameter less than 50, no need for love. Because advise the patient 50% all, almost always dissolved within three menstrual cycles. In case of simple cyst, and the diameters is between 50 and 70 millimeters, so here, yearly ultrasound follow-up. We need follow-up by ultrasound every annually, okay? So if the patient is simple cyst between 50 and 70 millimeters, the management by follow-up by ultrasound annually. If there is larger than 70 millimeter, those should be not imaging or surgical intervention. So this is very important here. If less than 50, do not follow, do not for regular follow-up. 50 to 70 millimeter, here early ultrasound follow-up. And if larger than 70, you have two options, either to do imaging, MRI, or surgical intervention. It depends on the symptom, or this is symptom pressure and depending on the condition of the patient. So you have two choice, either to choice MRI or surgical intervention. But I think here it's better to uh, focus on the imaging. Definition of ovarian cyst is a fluid containing structure more than 30 millimeter in diameter. So here we said this is ovarian cyst if the structure more than 30 millimeters in diameter. What about the persistent ovarian cyst increasing size? The ovarian cyst that persistent or increasing size are unlikely to be functional because increase rapidly and increasing size, this is unlikely to be functional and maybe warrant surgical management because maybe suspicion of malignancy. So here, because ovarian cyst uh, normally it is take long time and not increasing size. And if this persistent increasing size, this is may need for surgical management. 
So I will show here the, the table. What about the approach for the patient? We said before, the laparoscopic approach for the elective surgical management of a very masses associated with lower postoperative morbidity, that why we prefer to do laparoscopy rather than more, uh, laparotomy. And the second is the shorter recovery times. So, and cost effective and associated with the early discharge and return to work and refer to laparotomy in suitable patient. So this is uh, the advantage of the laparoscopy uh, and uh, if compared with the laparotomy. So this is advantage of laparoscopy, why we refer the laparoscopy. In the presence of the large masses with solid components, for example, larger dermoid cyst, laparotomy may be appropriate. So we can do many laparotomy. So the, if there's large cyst, you can do many laparotomy. So look for this chart here. Very simple to, to know about the management of a variant simple or various cyst. So it's very important to look, this is, it is, is it, cyst is simple. So if, if you give in the scenario, this is about simple or various cyst, then look for the diameter. If the diameter less than 50 millimeter, so no need for follow-up because this cyst dissolves in three minutes to a second. If the diameter between 50 to 70 millimeter, need yearly ultrasound follow-up. And if larger than 70 millimeter, so we have two option, MRI or surgical intervention. So this is simply about the management of simple ovarian cyst. Is it clear? Am I clear? Any question about this management? Because this is very important point and this is very important chart in this in this uh, guideline. If you remember this, you will solve a lot of questions in the exam because most of the scenario of the exam ask about the, uh, give you scenario about the uh, variance is symbol and you give you the meter. So if I have three options here, okay? So the second guideline is about the management of ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women. Let us discuss the management of suspected ovarian masses in perimenopausal women. Here, this is the management of the ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women. Ovarian cysts are common in postmenopausal women, and incidence of ovarian cysts are common in postmenopausal women between 5% to 17%. So this is about the incidence of ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women between 5% to 17%. The vast majority of these identified cysts are benign, like very many poison. So therefore, the underlying management rationally is distinguished between those cysts that are penine and those that are potential management. So it's very important here to differentiate between cyst, this is a benign cyst or this is a malignant cyst. How to diagnose of the ovarian cyst in postmenopausal? Woman, so clinician should be aware of the different presentation and significance of ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women. So here, yeah, it's very important to know about the different pre presentation of the ovarian cyst in case of perimenopausal because there's high risk of the ovarian cancer and the significance of ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women. So ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women could present in one of three ways. 
So you need to know about the different presentation. This is about three way for presentation of the ovarian cyst in post menopausal woman. So some women present with acute pain, for example, as ovarian torsion or rupture or ovarian hemorrhagic cyst, require, require immediate evaluation. So this is the SPA question, circle question. So be mentioned as before in previous guideline. Other women have their ovarian cysts identified during gynecological investigation, for example, postmenopausal bleeding. Maybe uh, found uh, as accidentally in case of postmenopausal bleeding. Some ovarian cysts are found accidentally in postmenopausal women undergoing investigation by other specialists for non gynecological condition because a lot of cases discovered accidentally, maybe during investigation or during operation. Uh, in postmenopausal women, Presenting with acute abdominal pain, the diagnosis of ovarian cyst accidents should be considered like torsion, rupture of hemorrhagic, rupture of ovarian cyst and hemorrhagic cyst. We go immediate evaluation. So this is the SPA question. Yeah, we need our regret require immediate evaluation. It is recommended that the ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women should be initially assessed by measuring serum cancer antigen 125. So here, CA125 is very important. So in case of suspicion of ovarian cyst, you should, in case of birth money bosal woman, you should initially assess by CA125 and trans vaginal ultrasound scan. So this is very important point because maybe came in exam as EMQ. So in if you use this ovarian cyst and this postmenopausal, the first investigation is the C125, C125, looking for the option in C125 and transvaginal ultrasound. So this is a very important point in management of the postmenopausal woman. So here, what about uh, the history and examination? A medical history should be taken for the woman, from the woman, with specific attention to the risk factors, same as the case in perimenopausal, and symptoms suggestive of ovarian malignancy and the family history of ovarian power or breast cancer. So here, the family history is very important in case of ovarian ovarian cyst in postmenopausal. Where your family history is significant, so if you found this, any family history is positive, referral to regional cancer genetic service should be considered. And this is the EMQ question. So yeah, attention for the risk factor and ask about the family history. If your family history is significant, so refer this patient to the regional cancer genetic service should be considered. A woman is defined as being at high risk of ovarian cancer if she has a first degree relative in mothers or father, sister, brother, daughters, or son, affected by cancer within family with. So here we classify the woman as very high risk for ovarian cancer if have first degree relative with two or more individual with ovarian cancer who are first degree relative of each other. So if you found these two or more individual with ovarian cancer who are first degree relative of each other, we classify it as, as high risk ovarian Cancer if there is first degree and if there is two or more individual with ovarian cancer who are first degree relative of each other. And if one individual with ovarian cancer at any age 
one with the best cancer diagnosis under age 50 years who are first degree relative of each other. Or one relative with ovarian cancer at any age and two with breast cancer diagnosed with under age 60 years who are connected by the first degree relationship. Or three or more family members with colon cancer or two with colon cancer and one with stomach, ovarian, endometrial, urinary tract, or small bowel cancer in two generations. Or one of this cancer must be diagnosed under age 50 years, an affected relative should be first degree relative of each other. And finally, one individual with post press and ovarian cancer. This is classified as high risk patient. Appropriate tests should be carried out in any postmenopausal woman who are developed symptom within last 12 months that suggests irritable bowel syndrome, particularly in women over 50 years of age or those with significant family history of ovarian bowel or breast cancer. This is very important. So here, if the woman have developed symptom last 12 hours, 12 months, sorry, that suggests this irritable bowel syndrome, particularly in women with over age of 50 or the significant family history of, of, of ovarian bowel or breast cancer. So we, we should do appropriate tests. A full physical examination of women is essential and should include body mass index, PMI, and abdominal examination to detect a site and characterize any palpable mass and vaginal examination. So here, after the history, important point in examination and physical examination, so we'll estimate the body mass index and do abdominal examination beside vaginal examination. So this is the important thing in examination. So in physical examination, look for PMI and abdominal examination and vaginal examination. So what about the blood test? CA125, CA125 should be the only serum tumor marker used for primary evaluation as it is for, allow the risk of malignant index of ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women to be calculated. So here, CA125 is very important in uh, risk of malignant index. CA125 level should not be used in isolation to determine if the cyst is malignant. While a very high value may be assist in reaching the diagnosis, a normal value does not exclude ovarian cancer due to then on a specific nature of the test. So here, if it's very high, it assists in the diagnosis of malignance, but if normal value of the C125, this is do not exclude ovarian cancer. What about the other markers, tumor market? There is currently not enough evidence to support the routine clinical use of the other tumor markers, such as human epidemiologist protein 4 and cancer embryonic antigen and CDX2, cancer antigen 724, cancer antigen 199 alpha fetoprotein like the dehydrogenase or PSG to assess the risk of malignant and postmenopausal ovarian cyst. So here, the most important one is the C125. What about the imaging? Here, a transvaginal 
pelvic ultrasound is the single most effective way of evaluating ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women. So this is the recall question. It is as the perimenopausal here transvaginal ultrasound here is the single most effective way for evaluating ovarian cyst in perimenopausal and in postmenopausal women. And trans abdominal ultrasound should not be used in isolation. So we prefer transvaginal ultrasound. We can use combination transvaginal pelvic ultrasound with trans abdominal ultrasound if needed. Here, this table or this chart show the, the feature of the simple or complex cyst by ultrasound examination. So here, this is very important because uh, many questions maybe give you a scenario and when the feature of simple cyst and give you option for post ovarian cyst. So here, look for, you should memorize this. What is the feature of simple cyst and the feature of complex cyst? Because here the investigation and management here is different. It depending on the, Symbol cyst or the complex cyst. So the feature of symbol cyst is this round or oval, oval shape, thin or and the posterior enhancement or in cogix <clears throat> fluids absent of septation or nodules. The feature of complex cyst, complete septation, multiocular solid and papillary projection. So this is, if you find one of these four, if complete septation or multiocular cyst or the solid nodules or papillary projection, this is the feature of complex. And this is the feature of symbols. It's a very important job. So uh, CT scan, MRI, and the strong emission tomography PT scan are not recommended for the initial evaluation of, of ovarian cyst in perimenopausal women. What about the CT scan? CT scan should not be used routinely as the primary imaging tools for the initial assessment because said the initial assessment start by transvaginal ultrasound. So here, as not routinely as the primary imaging tools for the initial assessment of ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women because of its low specificity and it is limited assessment of ovarian internal morphology and it is use of ionizing radiation. So if from the clinical picture, ultrasound finding and the tumor marker malignant disease is suspected, a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis should be arranged with onward referral to the gynecological oncology multidisciplinary team. So we'll, so we'll use indication for the CT scan of the abdomen and pelvic if there is clinical suspicion, the ultrasound finding and tumor marker, this, the malignant is suspected. So here we can do CT scan. What about MRI? MRI is very important in yeah, this of the ovarian cyst in postmenopausal if the ultrasound is inconclusive. So MRI should not be used routinely as a primary imaging tools for the initial assessment of ovarian cyst in postmenopausal. So MRI should be used as the second line after the ultrasound is inconclusive. So if you found the ultrasound inconclusive, you should do the second steps to do MRI. So this is very important in EMQ question. We'll give you a scenario and asking about the investigation. So look, look so look for this any ultrasound and ultrasound finding is conclu inconclusive. So you choose the MRI. If this the patient is only tumor marker and there's no investigation, no imaging, you should choose the ultrasound. And ultrasound if you find transvaginal and transabdominal, you should transvaginal ultrasound. So this is about investigation and imaging in case of ovarian. So this is about uh, to our groups, 
symbol ultrasound rule which mentioned before in the previous guideline. So this is the important chart here because uh, this is about the management of the post menopausal ovarian system because this is very important. A lot of questions. Every exam is more than two or three questions asking about the post menopausal ovarian system in SPA and EMQ. So this is a very important chart. So post menopausal ovarian woman and the sick lesion one centimeter or more. So if you this have case of post menopausal cyst. So here the case is post menopausal. Then the next step is to measure. We have two important things for evaluation of the post menopausal. So here CA125 and ultrasound. Why? Because we need to calculate the risk of malignant. So this is very important to do ultrasound and to do the CA125. Look for the right arm here. A risk, if you estimate or calculate the risk of malignant index, if there is less than 200, if the threshold is less than 200 or more than 200. So here the management is different because there is the risk of malignant in of malignancy here is different because if less than 200, there is low risk for malignancy. If the risk of malignant index more than is about 200 or more, so the cut point here is 200. If they in examination you give you a scenario of the, the risk of malignancy is 200, this is the high risk. If less than 200 okay this is the low risk okay so if the risk of malignancy is less than 200 this is patient half low risk so this fulfilling all the following criteria so look for the criteria of the cyst if asymptomatic symbol cyst less than five centimeter nuclear and unilateral, so this is for conservative management. Here, conservative management is if there is risk of malignant index less than 200, and this is simple cyst with less than five centimeter. This means 4.9 can fulfill this criteria, but if the five is not this criteria not included in this criteria because this is cyst less than less than five centimeters and unilateral and unilateral and simple cyst so this is for conservative meaning so repeat c ultrasound and repeat c125 after four to six months so after four to six months so here if you repeat the assessment after give a patient appointment after four to six months and if you do ultrasound and c125 if the cyst resolved spontaneously so discharge the no need for follow-up if persistent and change so you can give uh, another appointment after four to six months and then assess her. If resolved, you can discharge the patient. And this is may, uh, individualized treatment after discussion with the patient. And in case of give appointment after four to six months and the C125 and trans vaginal ultrasound, this change in feature may be increasing size. So this is high suspicion of malignancy. So here consider intervention. So this is very important. If the cyst here, if the risk of malignancy in this less than 200, and the cyst is not following fulfill all the criteria because it may be symptomatic and then simple 
feature or the more than five centimeter or multiocular or bilateral here consider surgery we'll do solving of rectomy usually bilateral this is a lot of spa came in exam ask about the patient have ovarian system and more than five so we'll do either bilateral or unilateral so here usually prefer unilateral this is came in february 2020 the left arm of the chart is the risk of malignant index more than 200 and this is high risk of malignancy. so we need we mentioned before you do ct scan because we said ct scan if there's any suspicion of malignancy after investigation of by ultrasound and c125 so we need to do CT scan and refer for the gynecological oncology. So multidisciplinary, we need multidisciplinary team to review this patient. So if this multidisciplinary team is review this patient, so is this high risk of malignance or there is low risk of malignance? These two options here. Yeah. If there's high risk, we need to do laboratory, stage laboratory, full staging proceed by a trained gynecological oncologist. This is in case of high risk of malignancy. If there is low, can do laparotomy. Here, pelvic clearance. We should do total abdominal hysterectomy with pilala cell of rectum. So this this is about how to manage the patient in post menopausal woman. So is, is it clear? So in a question is this. Chart. So please follow this uh, follow chart for the ma management of ovarian cyst. Okay, and you need to follow all the steps to solve the MQ in this exam because this chart I mentioned about can solve every AMQ and SPN exam. So with ferris suspicion and do ca125 and transfusion ultrasound so and the risk of malignancy is very important so i have the question if the patient was menopausal patient with ovarian cyst what is the first step so if you're given the scenario the patient was menopausal woman and have ovarian cyst. What is the first step? To do a CA one twenty five. Yes. Thank and you. And then calculate so, the RML. Yeah. What is the next step? Calculate the, the RMI. Yes. CA one twenty five. Yes. The aim here is to calculate the risk of malignant index. So the first step to do CA one twenty five. Then the next step to do transvaginal ultrasound. So this is the important step to investigate the patient with postmenopausal ovarian cyst. So if M RMI more than 200, this is the question in exam, record question. What about the first step? BMI, CT should be done. Stop. CT should be done before sending yeah, to the yes, MDT. So if there is risk of malignant index, you after you calculate the risk of malignant index and you find this is about 200 or more, you need to do CT scan. This is the only indication for CT scan in patient of ovarian cyst, evaluation of ovarian cyst. So MRI is indicated if the ultrasound is inconclusive. And the CT scan if the risk of malignant index is 200 or more. So the first step to, to do CT scan of the abdomen. Look for this. This is the question in exam. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wibi. Dr. Fat, can I ask you one question? Welcome, Dr. Wibi. 
Yeah, uh, there was one scenario in that uh, one patient uh, has this persistent cyst, uh, like after two follow up also, like after one year, the patient comes back and the cyst is still there. So should that answer be discharge or uh, do the BSO? Like because here in the flow chart, it is written individualize the treatment. Either you can it's consider the intervention post postmenopausal. Because menopausal. here it is very con confusion. Now, the last part of the chart says if it is uh, the same, then uh, either you can discharge or you can consider the intervention. What about so the what risk of mal malignancy of index? Like a row risk only. Like uh, it's just it's written in the question. I think it's one of the recall. Uh, it's after yes, one maybe. year also. It's the same cyst is the same, less than five centimeter, and yes. the low malignancy index. Unchanged. If unchanged, unchanged, and unchanged. If yeah, unchanged, unchanged. And zero, uh, risk of malignant in this is uh, low, low, less than 200. So yes, this is yes. individualized malignant. So it depends on the patient, on the condition of the patient. Okay. But if the risk of malignant in this is more than 200 or higher suspicion of malignancy, so we'll do the CT scan. Okay. But I think the scenario about the patient low risk of malignant so if low risk of malignant and the still the be resistant unchanged you can give appointment after four to six months if they still unchanged this is a need individualized treatment so the cancel the patient about the management about the risk of ovarian cancer and they can use surgical intervention or discharge the patient so okay. the treatment here individualized so it depends on the option give you in the exam. But okay. both you because mind, in the, if, in the uh, option, it was both BSO and discharge. So it's very confusing. Yes, no discharge. discharge and consider intervention. Okay. So here, okay. Uh, really confused here, uh, because it is individualized treatment. So it depends yeah, on yeah. the scenario. Because okay. in the recall, this may be poor scenario or deficient scenario. But in the exam, we give you scenario about maybe a patient, uh, give you a clue about if this patient have high risk or have family history. So this, is, this can give you a clue about to do surgical intervention. But if there's no risk history and there's resistant change, I will discharge this patient. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. If it's still a change and there is no risk or for uh, this low risk, uh, it's better to discharge the patient. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, welcome dear. So this is going to start the question and after that we'll uh, discuss the last guideline about the long-term consequence of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So who will share with us the description? Hello, sir. Hello, Dr. Asif. How are you fine? During and yes, sir. How are you? Welcome there. During an MRI scan for back pain, a 68-year-old woman was found to have an incidental finding of a four-centimeter simple ovarian cyst. This was confirmed by a transvaginal ultrasound scan. She had a hysterectomy at the age of 38 years for heavy menstrual bleeding, but her ovaries were conserved. Her serum CA125 level was 17 international unit per liter. What is the most appropriate management? Four centimeter simple cyst. So this is postmenopausal. Postmenopausal. Sir, a yes. follow up. Yes. Arrange Single a follow up cyst. ultrasound scan in four months and here c125 is 17 because this is the low risk for malignancy yes uh, it's about four centimeters what is your management sir a arrange a follow-up ultrasound scan yes here in if four months option give you discharge discharge is patient we give uh, sorry forgive this is after four months four to six months we need yes, to sir. arrange 
to follow up ultrasound scan in four months or four to six months. Excellent, Dr. Abed. This as if, okay. Yes. So answer is A. Please, can you read explanation, Dr. Asif? Yes, sir. Simple unilateral unilocular ovarian cyst of less than five centimeter in diameter have a low risk of malignancy. It is recommended that in the presence of normal serum CA125 levels, they be managed conservatively. Numerous studies have looked at the risk of malignancy in ovarian cyst. Comparing ultrasound morphology with either histology at subsequent surgery or by close follow-up of those women managed conservatively. The risk of malignancy in these studies of cyst that are less than 5 cm unilateral, unilocular and eco-free with no solid purse or papillary formations is less than 1%. In addition, more uh, more than 50% of this cyst will resolve spontaneously within three months. Thus, it is reasonable to manage this cyst conservatively with a follow-up ultrasound scan for cyst of two to five centimeter, uh, reasonable interval being four months. This, of course, depends on the views and symptoms of the woman and on gynecologist clinical assessment. Thank you, Dr. Asif. Next question, please. You are asked by the FY1 on the word to review a patient pelvic ultrasound report as it has shown an ovarian mass. Which of the following should be suggestive of a benign lesion? Ascites, unilocular cyst, very strong blood flow, irregular solid tumor, presence of four papillary structure. So unilocular cyst B. Yes, excellent. This is P because this is so the four other option is this is option for uh, suspect of uh, complex cyst. So this is the feature of simple cyst is the unilocular cyst. Thank you, Dr. Asif. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So question three. Question three. Hello, uh, can I take this question? I'll try it. Yes, of course. Yeah, sure question number three. Number three. Uh, your Thank consultant you. agrees to assist you performing laparoscopic removal of presumed benign ovarian mass. Which of the following statement is true? A, a chemical peritonitis due to spillage of dermoid cyst content occurs in 2 to 5% of cases. Uh, recurrence rate of laparoscopic needle aspiration of simple cyst is 10%. Removal of benign ovarian masses should be via the umbilical port. Recurrence rate after laparoscopic needle aspiration of simple cyst is 20%. The COCP promotes a resolution of functional ovarian cyst. Out of conclusion, I think I will go with A. It's 2 to 5% of spillage uh, with a dermoid cyst. Option A. Yeah. Option because A. removal of the malignant yeah. masses are by the yes. umbilical port. Maybe from the like port is about. So answer should be A, I think. The chemical peritonitis due to spillage oh, of dermoid cyst. Talk about the port for 10% here. Side. Here, removal of ovarian cyst should be where? Should be by umbilical port. I think it is like for the. Oh, it's not it's correct. For 10%. I think. Hmm. It's for 10%. 41%. Yes. Okay. Okay, 41% is what? Okay, see, the laparoscopic removal of ov benign ovarian masses should be by umbilical port, as this is associated with less post-operative pain and quicker operating time. Where possible, removal of benign ovarian masses should be by the umbilical port, as this is associated with 
less post operative pain and quicker operating time than when the latter ports are used okay sorry i got confused chemical peritonitis due to spillage of dermoid cyst is less than 0.2 percent thickerance rates after laparoscopic needle aspiration of simple cyst is from 53 to as high as 84 percent and the cocp does not promote the resolution of functional ovarian cyst yes question okay question number four a 38 year old woman attends clinic follow-up you note pelvic ultrasound shows a 36 millimeter simple cyst. What is the most appropriate course of action of this cyst as per the RCOG? So she's perimenopause, like she's 38 and the cyst is less than 5 centimeter. So answer should be A, discharge with no follow-up. Yes, A, here is the best answer here. Discharge the patient with no need for follow-up. Thank you, Dr. Vajbi. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. I'll read the explanation. A, as this is a simple cyst, okay. Yes, 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 please. As this is a simple cyst less than 50 mm in diameter, the patient does not require further investigation or routine follow-up. Uh, as RCOG, uh, GTG 62 states the following women with simple ovarian cyst of 50 to 70 mm in diameter should have yearly ultrasound follow-up and those with larger simple cysts should cons be considered for either further MRI or surgical intervention. A serum CA125 assay does not need to be undertaken in all, all premenopausal women when an ultrasonographic diagnosis of simple ovarian cyst has been made. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vishbeer. Dr. Abtihal. Uh, yes, uh, how are you, Dr. Fatah? Uh, fine, and yes. Good evening uh, well. to all. You're well. Okay, I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Uh, so, uh, question number five, you are asked by the FY1 on the world to view a patient's pelvic ultrasound report as it has shown an ovarian mass. Which of the following would be the suggestive of benign lesion? Uh, presence of uh, A, uh, presence of acoustic uh, 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 shadowing. Uh, the answer is A. Yes. Yes, excellent, Dr. Abdiyal, because this is the answer for this question. Uh, Please read the explanation. The presence of acoustic shad shadowing in an ovarian mass and ultrasound is reassuring. The above options are a part of the IOTA ultrasound rules, rules and can be used to classify an ovarian lesion as benign B rules and malignant M rules or malignant. Um, but, okay. okay. The next. Next question. Okay. Question six. A 43-year-old is seen in a clinic following a pelvic ultrasound scan for recurrent urinary tract infection. The ultrasound also documents an incidental finding of 70 mm by 72 mm by 76 mm ovarian cyst. Her BMI is 23.5 kg per meter. Blood pressure 120 over 80 and she is a non-smoker. There is no personal or family history of VT arterial disease or cancer, what is the most appropriate management option from the option listed? Um, so between okay. five to seven. And this is more than, this is more than uh, seven, and uh, the patient yeah. is uh, premenopausal, so we need a surgical intervention or MRI, further intervention. So I will go with D. Yeah, because D. Okay, here I think it's. Uh, or what? Yes, yes, D, you are right. Here for surgical. Uh, excision. Yes, yes. As the yes. finding 78 by yes, 72 by 72. Right. I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Okay, Excellent. welcome. I will read. This more than yes. 70 millimeter diameter are difficult to assess with the ultrasound and should be considered for further evaluation. 
with MRI scan or be surgically removed. Since more than 70 millimeter diameter are difficult to assess with, I think same, same answer. When you see a question that uh, documents uh, assess more than 70 millimeter or more than 50 millimeter that is enlarging, then you should be looking for options to perform an MRI on the cyst or remove it surgically. Aspiration is uh, considered less effective and is associated with a high rate of recurrence. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tehal. Welcome, Dr. Arafat. Welcome. Dr. Da. Dr. Sadia. Dr. Da. Hello. Okay. Yes. Hello, Dr. Da. How yes. Hello. Alhamdulillah. Hello. I'm fine. Welcome. Uh, question seven, a 39 year old is seen in clinic following a follow up ultrasound scan for mm -hmm. an asymptomatic ovarian cyst. The scan has shown her left ovarian cyst has increased in size from 55 millimeter to 70 millimeter in 12 months. What is the most appropriate management option? Uh, so start this combined. Suspicion of of malignant, yeah? This yes. increase in size. So this is the indication only for. For the next uh, step. Yes, start combined oral condom for respiration, laparoscopic excision. C. Yeah, is the laparoscopic excision. Yes, excellent. This is the, because this is highly suspicion of malignance and Malignant. it's about 5 to 55 millimeter to 70. But here, there is increasing size. So this is yeah. for laparoscopic incision. Excellent, Dr. Adar. Ovarian cyst uh, in the 50 to 70 millimeter size group that persists or increase in size should be considered for surgical excision. Cysts less than 50 do not require follow-up and usually resort within three menstrual cycles. Cysts between 50 and, and 70 should have yearly ultrasound scan. Cysts uh, over 70 should be considered for MRI or surgery. It is important to note, however, when following up cysts in the 50 to 70 millimeter group that surgery is usually indicated if the ovarian cyst persists or increase in size. This is due to the fact that cysts that increase in size over several cycles are unlikely to be Functional and usually, uh, usually warrant surgical intervention management. Okay, the next question. Okay. Question eight. Question eight. Uh, 32-year-old woman with dull lower abdominal pain and bloating had a pelvic ultrasound scan arranged by her general practitioner. Uh, the results show simple 30 millimeter right-sided ovarian cyst. There are no other concerns. What is the most appropriate next step in her management? So this okay, is perimenopausal. Perimenopausal simple cyst. cyst. And less than uh, five. Less than less than 50. No need for follow-up. Yes. So this is no need reassure for follow-up. Yeah. Reassure and discharge this without follow-up. This is the best answer here. It's reassurance and discharge of patient without follow-up. Follow up. There is this explanation. Yes. E explanation. Premenopausal women with simple cysts less than 50 millimeter do not require follow-up as mm -hmm. these cysts are physiological and almost always mm -hmm. always resolve within three menstrual cycles. Yes, excellent. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Da. Dr. Welcome. Hello, Salam Alaikum. Dr. Sadia. Hello, Salam Alaikum. Dr. Sadia, welcome, dear. Fine. Hope you are well. Alhamdulillah. Question number nine: A 46-year-old Nadi Paris woman is seen with bloating and weight loss. Ultrasound confirms the presence of an irregular vascular 7-centimeter solid region adjacent to the left ovary. Ascites is present. What is the most appropriate course of management? Abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral serpentine and omental biopsy, 
laparoscopic removal of left ovarian mass, laparotomy and removal of left ovarian mass, referred to gynecological gynecologist oncologist, and requ request MRI pelvis. I think we will so refer her to gynecologist video? oncologist. This so is here, a malignant. Yes, yes, yes I, malignant suspicion. So I will. So best answer is referred to gynecologist. Oncologist. Thank you. Yes. Both the patient symptoms and ultrasound findings suggest a suspicious gain warranting referral to the gynecology oncology team. Okay, the next, please. Uh, question number 11. A 24 year old woman presenting with a history of menorrhagia is found to have a 4 cm simple left ovarian cyst. What is the most appropriate management? Obtain consent for laparoscopic left ovarian aspiration. Obtain consent for laparoscopic left ovarian cystectomy. Repeat ultrasound in four weeks. Request serum CA125. Routine follow up is not required and the patient should be reassured. Uh, four centimeter and simple cyst, so E. Simple cyst, e. perimenopausal E, excellent. Yes, E is uh, the best choice here. This patient no routine follow-up. So discharge okay, the patient yeah. and no need for follow-up. Okay. Yes. CA125 is not required unless there are complex features or the woman is postmenopausal. The patient can be discharged and reassured if the ovarian cyst is found to be simple and less than five centimeter in size with no symptoms. If torsion is suspected and the cyst is confirmed, prompt laparoscopic assessment and untwisting of the pedicle may res rescue the ovary. Okay, thank you, Dr. Asaria. Welcome, Dr. Parker. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Salma. Um, Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum uh, salam, Dr. Salma. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Uh, 60 years old woman had an ultrasound scan for my lower abdominal discomfort. Uh, finding were as follows multicystic fluctuated mass on the right, measuring 6 by 7 cm with a small solid. Interacistic area and areas of uh, bubbly projection into largest of the cyst. The uterus is uh, atrophic with thin endometrium that measures one millimeter. Uh, the contralateral ovary was not seen, and there is no fluid in the abdomen or bilpis. Uh, quantified CA 125 was reported as 50 international unit per month. What is the risk of malignancy index? in this patient. Type, yeah, okay. The patient half is first when boy is a woman. So we'll give her a score. Three. Three, and C125 um, is? 50. Multiply by top. So what about the ultrasound findings? Uh, Multicystic. Uh, uh, I'm going with uh, complex uh, yes. cyst, not simple. Yes. Um, solid, yes. And this per area per Also. Okay. So this is, yes. Mm. So this, uh, what is your answer? Mm. What about D? Sorry. Sorry. Agree with D? Because okay. this score for index, he has three score and the ultrasound score multiplied by C125 score. So the answer here will 450 for the explanation. Uh, the risk of malignancy index uh, is calculated as the product of UMCA125, where U is the ultrasound score. One of ultrasound scan score uh, of one, three for ultrasound score of two to five. Uh, where each of these parameters scores one multilocular solid areas, metastasis, ascites, and bilateral yes, lesion. Two. 
if two or more, we give a score three for ultrasound. And um, post hmm. menopausal three, and the C125, 50. So uh, it's about three multiplied by 50, multiplied by three, it is about 450. Hmm. Yeah, this is about risk of anemia. M is the uh, menopause. MQ. Question 13. Dr. Zubaida. Dr. Wesson. Yes, doctor. 26-year-old, uh, 26-year-old woman present to the gynecology OPD with ultrasound scan of her pelvis for menorrhagia. It reports an anechoic ovarian cyst of 28 millimeter by uh, 37 millimeter on the right side. No other abnormal findings are reported. So she's uh, perimenopausal, 26 year old, and a small, simple cyst, no other anomaly. So reassure and discharge, no need follow up. Yeah, this is for. So here only. Uh, the expectant management because yeah, no, no discharge. If you find this, there is uh, this, no need for follow up. This is, if this expectant, you can choose expectant. But here, yeah. the right answer to is no reassurance and discharge of patient. No need for follow up. Excellent, Victoria. Awesome. Next question. Uh, a 54 year old woman present with abdominal pain and has uh, had an ultrasound scan done. It showed an ovarian cyst which triggered uh, a transvaginal scan. Pain has resolved now uh, a 46 millimeter cyst with a thin wall uh, within the normal uh, CA125 is noted. She has a repeat scan after two months that shows a 58 millimeter cyst with similar features and normal uh, tumor markers. No new symptoms are noted. So it is so unchanged. It, it is unchanged. It's like uh, persistent, the same finding. Yes, we can give her appointment after four to six months and then you can discuss uh, individualized management, okay? So what is the answer here? So here we said if uh, uh, if it is the same yes. and repeated it twice, that means uh, it will be like mm -hmm. uh, discharge? Yes, uh, or? It is the same, discharge or removal? But yes. here we will go yeah. for for expectant management because they mentioned that there is no change, it is the same. Yes. What is the answer here? The answer setting is D. Yes, and 14 is J. I choose the laparoscopic removal of cyst. Um, doctor, why here uh, laparoscopic removal of cyst? Because it was the same uh, uh, question of Dr. Uh, Pushby. If it is uh, persistent, like you repeated after uh, four to six months, which was here the same, the scan was here repeated depends, and almost yes. the finding the same. Uh, and it was, uh, according to the chart, in individualized. Here is the difference. Here increase the size and size with a similar feature, okay. but here from 46 millimeter to 80, uh, 58 mm, uh, millimeter. So here increasing in size. So this is suspicion of malignance, especially in case post So need for oh, okay. microscopic excision. Okay. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, doctor.
اوكي آه. ولا تختار ذا لاست جايد لاين اتس اباوت لونج تيرم كونسيكونسز اوف بوليستيك اوفيريان اوفر سندروم introduction about the PCO. PCO is a common disorder often complicated by chronic anovulatory infertility and hyperandrogenism. With the clinical manifestation of oligomenorrhea and hirsutism and acne. So this is the important feature or the important feature of the PCO is anovulatory infertility and hyperandrogenism because hyperandrogenism a lot of Causes a lot of manifestation like oligomenorrhea and hirsutism and acne. So many women with this condition are obese. The obesity has the risk factor for PCO and have a higher prevalence of umbilicostromas, type 2 diabetes, and sleep apnea than in observed in the general population. So the case of PCO have high risk of obesity and embed the course tolerance and type 2 diabetes and sleep apnea. So this is the long-term complication of patient with PCO. Also this uh, long-term consequence like cardiovascular risk. So cardiovascular risk profile characteristic of the cardiometabolic syndrome as suggested by higher reported incidence of hypertension, dyslipidemia, Visceral obesity, insulin resistant, and hyperinsulinemia. So, the cardiovascular risk is very important in case of BCO. So, what is the definition of hirsutism? What does it mean by hirsutism? It's very important feature of the hyperandrogenism. So, what is the definition of hirsutism? Excessive growth of hairs of the abnormal area. Yes, and maybe this is the presence of coarse terminal hair, dark and coarse hair in undergoing different area. So this is distribution of coarse terminal hair in different area. Maybe in chin or buttocks, this is the distributed area for hirsutism. What about the prevalence of BCO? According to the green top guidelines, the prevalence ranging from 2.2 to high, as high as 26%. So this is the prevalence of BCO, 2.2 to high as 26%. So this is in green top guideline. In top, it is, it is common as endocrine condition to affect women with estimated prevalence of 10 to 15%. This is the question in exam. So the, the prevalence of BCO is 10 to 15%. This is a talk about the talk article. And in the green top guideline, 2.2 to 26%. So uh, choose. 10 to 15 percent because the top is recent than green top guideline. As the prevalence of BCO may be different according to the ethnic background. So here, ethnic background here is very important in as the risk factor for BCO. For example, compared with Caucasian, as the high prevalence is noted among women with of South Asian origin, where it is present as younger. Age as has more severe symptoms. So this is related to the ethnic background. So the important thing in here in this guideline, how to diagnose the PCO, this is by Rotterdam criteria. So what does it mean by Rotterdam criteria? The Rotterdam criteria has suggested a border, a border definition for BCO. So with two out of three, so should found two out of three of the following criteria being diagnostic for this condition. So <clears throat> this is the three criteria. So you should found 
two out of three. If you want two of this, this is the diagnostic for BCO according to the to dam criteria. So what is the criteria? If there is polycystic ovaries, either 12 or more follicle or increase in ovarian volume. So more than 10 centimeter cube. So this is very important criteria. If you do ultrasound, you found this polycystic ovaries is more than 12 or more follicles, or the, if you estimate the ovarian volume, we found this is more than 10 centimeter cube. This is the criteria for, for PCO. And oligoovulation or an ovulation. This is if any uh, ministerial cycle disturbance, the oligoovulation or an ovulation. And the last is criteria is clinical or is with or without biochemical sign of hyperandrogenism, like acne, hirsutism. So this is the three important criteria for the diagnosis of BCO. If you found two of this, this is you can diagnose a BCO. The recommended baseline biochemical test for hyperandrogenism is the free androgen index and total testosterone divided by six hormone binding globulin. So six hormone binding globulin multiplied by 100. So this is SPA and this is the recall question ask about the baseline biochemical test for hyperandrogenism. So if you give you a scenario, the patient is hirsutism or the patient of BCO and the, we need investigation. So the first choice is the free androgen index. This is about rated down criteria mentioned before. Polycystic ovaries, either 12 or more, follicles or increased ovarian volume more than 10 centimeter cube or oligo ovulation and or ovulation, or there is clinical or biochemical sign of hyperandrogenism. If you find two out of the three of this following criteria, you can diagnose the BCO. So here, the ultrasound is very important in the diagnosis of the BCO. If this are sign of realization, example, deep voice, a reduced breast size, increased muscle, pulp, clitorian, hypertrophy, this is the sign of realization. And there is rapidly progressing hirsutism. What is the definition by rapidly progressing? Hirsutism, if less than one year between hirsutism being noted and seeking medical advice. Or high total testosterone level, if the testosterone greater than five nanomoles per liters, or more than twice the upper limit of normal reverence range. Androgen secreting tumor and late on certain non classical congenital other hyperbilization should be excluded. So if you found one of the three, is the sign of realization or rapidly progressing hirsutism or high total testosterone, more than five. So you should exclude the congenital adrenal hyperplasia and androgen secreting tumors. So because uh, normally is uh, PCO is the uh, testosterone level is less than five nanomoles per liter. So if you give scenario, the testosterone more than five nanomoles per liters. So seeking for thinking about the congenital adrenal hyperplasia or androgen secreting tumors. 17 hydroxyprogesterones should be measured in follicular phase and will be raised in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So this is to differentiate between 
uh, causes of hyperandrogenism because the PCO is the commonest cause of hyperandrogenism uh, and the congenital other hyperbase also can cause hyperandrogenism. However, it is possible to have congenital adrenal hyperplasia without the cisterone being greater than five nanomole, particularly if the woman is retinous for the, this condition. So, and hence measurement of the 17 hydroxyprogesterones should be considered if there's a high index of suspicion. For example, a specific groups such as Eskenazi choice or those with a family history of congenital adrenal hyperplasia since the management of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is different than OPCO. If the 17 hydroxyprogesterone is borderline, it will have to be confirmed by ACT edge stimulated test to diagnose congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So this is about how to diagnose congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Here, this is the ultrasound show, the polycystic ovary, ovaries. So uh, it is recommended ovary with 12 or more follicle measuring, two to nine, millimeter in diameter and or increase ovarian volume more than 10. This is recommended by a sheriff guideline to diagnose a PCO. What about the hyperandrogenism? Hyperandrogenism is one of the most common and stressing endocrine disorder in one of, of reproductive age because it's associated with the hirsutism and act. Androgen access result in develop of hirsutism. So if this androgen access can lead to hirsutism. So this is the presence of abnormal hair in different area and androgenic lucretia and acne or ovulatory dysfunction. This is maybe due to because there's less of testosterone. If testosterone is less, so more than uh, five millimole will lead to virilization and muscularization. So we mentioned before the the virilization, symptom of virilization is deep voice, increased muscle pulp, and suppressed atrophy, and large uterus. So this is about the presentation of hyper androgenism. This table show spectrum of clinical manifestation of polycystic ovary syndrome. The presentation of polycystic and possible lead signal. Uh, this is the third article. So the symptom is hyperandrogenism. So the clinical manifestation of hyper, hyperandrogenism in hepatitis acne and elevation. Ministerial disturbance, so we be present with the ministerial disturbance like leguminaria and infertility, and ovulatory infertility, and maybe present obesity. So this is the clinical presentation of PTO and a possible long-term consequence. It's type two diabetes mellitus, it's lipidemia, and also hypertension, cardiovascular risk, and endometrial carcinoma because the PCO is the risk factor for endometrial carcinoma. Here about the serum endocrinology in the PCO. So increase or normal androgen, testosterone and androstradiol. This is maybe increase or normal. So the level of testosterone is normal or at least, or androstradiol may be increased or normal. And 
increase or normal luteinizing hormone and evaluated in 40% usually slim woman. So maybe increase or normal, but elevated in 40%. And FSH is normal. Here is the normal fiber stimulating hormone. Increase or normal fasting insulin or decrease or normal six pidin clopidin or increase or normal estradiol and increase anti mullerian hormone. This is the change of the hormone in case of PCO. So the most important thing is the elevated luteinizing hormone and normal follicular uh, stimulating hormone and maybe increase of the strong. Yes, uh, hirsutism, the definition of hirsutism, the presence of coarse terminal hairs, stark or coarse hair in androgen dependent area, like chain here and potex. And it is affected between 2 to 10% to of women between the age of 18 and 45. So this is the incidence of hirsutism. Yeah, this, this is the area for hirsutism. Here, how to evaluate patients with hirsutism by Friedman Calway scales. We put the score one to two, four is given for nine areas of the body. If your total score less than eight, this is normal. So, you give a score if less than eight, it's normal. Score between 8 to 15 indicate mild hirsutism. And if greater than 15, this indicates more moderate or severe hirsutism. This is about classification of hirsutism. It's a mild, moderate, or severe hirsutism. So, what about the pathophysiology of BCO? So the most important thing here is the hyperinsulin uh, or insulin resistance. So this is the important thing in both of the of BCO, it is the insulin resistance. So sorry. Okay, if the first is this insulin resistant. If there's insulin, insulin resistant. If there's insulin resistant, this can lead to increased level of level of insulin because there's insulin resistant. So there's hyperinsulinemia. So hyperinsulinemia can lead to three things. Either lead to metabolic effect, metabolic effect, and lead to the most important thing is to decrease six hormone binding globulin, six hormone binding. So this is the importance here. High level of the insulin, hyperinsulinemia can lead to uh, sick by hormone binding because this has direct effect on the ovaries. And also, the important thing is increase insulin like growth factor when insulin like gross factor one this is very important okay because this is have affected the ovaries and lead to an effect directly the follicle development so the increase of insulin gross factor one can affect the ovaries here the ovaries lead to affect 
follicle development. So why we affect the, fo uh, the follicle development? Because it is, it is the effect is a function of the CK cell and made the CK cell more functioning than granulosa cell. So if the CK cell is function more than granulosa cells, this is lead to increase more estrogen. Sorry, decrease estrogen. Decrease estrogen. If there is the CK cell be dominant, if the CK cell become dominant on the granulosa cell, this is lead to decrease the estrogen production from the ovary. And also there is no progesterone and increase also the testosterone. This is the effect of on the insulin growth factor when on the follicle development and then the result is the decrease the estrogen and no progesterone and increase testosterone. So this is lead to no, no development of the follicle. No development of the follicle. And this leads to atresia. Lead to atresia. So if there is atresia or arrest of the follicle development, this is because if your follicle development, follicle development, if the follicle de development is arrest, this is lead to ministerial cycle disturbance. Ministerial cycle disturbance. So this is also can affect on the because low estrogen can affect the pituitary gland to increase more than LH. This is also can affect pituitary gland lead to increase more than LH because there is no feedback and also can affect the uterus. So we can lead to endometrial hyperplasia or irregular bleeding because and this is about the pathophysiology of the BCO. So the important one is the insulin resistance lead to hyperinsulinemia, lead to hyperinsulinemia, and then effect the metabolic can lead to metabolic effect or decrease six spine uh, globulin. And the most important one is increase insulin growth factor one. This can affect the follicle development, and this is if there's arrest or the uh, effect of the follicle development can lead to decrease estrogen and progesterone and increase the strong. So this is, can affect the ministerial cycle, stubborn, and also the pituitary gland and the drug. This is simply about the, about the pathophysiology of PCO. Is it clear? Okay. What about the counseling of the patient with PCO? Woman diagnosed with PCO should be informed of the possible long-term risk to health that are associated with their condition by their health care professional. So the counseling here is very important and Cancel about the long-term consequence and the metabolic consequence of BCO. What is about metabolic consequence of BCO? So a clinician may be considered ovarian screening for the gestational diabetes to the woman who have been diagnosed and as having BCO before the pregnancy. This should be performed at 24, 28 weeks of gestation with referral to a specialist obstetric diabetic service if abnormalities are detected. So this is very important point. So if the patient have BCO before the pregnancy should be screening for gestational diabetes in about 24 to 28 weeks of gestation. And with referral to the specialist of obstetric diabetic service. If this 
any abnormalities are detected. So this is SPA question asking about the screening for the gestational diabetes in patient with PCO. Okay, this will be done in 24 to 28 weeks of gestation. And if there's any abnormalities, you can refer this patient for obesthetic diabetic service. The prevalence of gestational diabetes us, is twice as high among women with PCO compared to the control woman. So here the risk of gestational diabetes is high. It's in BCO, it's twice if compared with control woman. Clinician may be considered <coughs> sorry, even at two hours post 75 gram oral gelocosterone test to all pregnant women with PCO, similar as for screening in women with any other risk factor for gestational diabetes. So we'll do GTT. So consider over in GTT at 22 hours post 75 grams to all women to all women with PCO and pregnant, to all pregnant women with BCO. So every woman will pregnant woman with PCO, so consider to over the two hours post 70, 75 gram oral gelocosterone test. How should women with PCO be screened for type 2 diabetes? This is important because this is the recall question. Women present with PCO who are overweight body mass index more than 25 kilogram per meter squared, and women with PCO who are not overweight, so BMI less than 25 uh, kilogram uh, millimeters squared, but who have additional risk factor such as advanced maternal age, more than 40, or if there's personal history for gestational diabetes or family history of type 2 diabetes could have two hours post 75 gram oral gelocosterone test performed. So here, if the patient have BCO, should screen for diabetes type 2 at the 20, 24 to 28 weeks. So look for the patient if, if either overweighted, this means that more than 25, this is immediately we need to, to do. So this patient is the criteria for screening for gestational for type 2 diabetes. And if a woman or woman with not overrated, but there is other risk factor, such as advanced maternal age, personal history of gestational diabetes, and family history of type 2 diabetes, you need to do two hours post prandial 75 gram oral gelocosterone test. So it is option, uh, to option, patient with PCO and overweighted more than 25 kilograms should be screened for type 2. Or patient PCO and not overweight. But this additional risk factor, like advanced age and personal history and gestational diabetes or family history of type 2, should do two hours. post annual 75 gram oral gelocosterone test. So in talk article, we said with syndrome, a five-fold increase in risk for diabetes type 2. So if, if there's any metabolic syndrome, so this increases the risk for type 2 about five-fold. In women with impaired fasting glucose, fasting plasma, glucose divided from 6.1 millimole 
to 6.9 millimole or ampere gelocosterone plasma gelocose of 7.8 millimole or more than or more but less than 11.1 per millimole per liters after two hours gelocosterone test or oral gelocosterone test should be performed annually so if this woman have in bed fasting glucose or in bed glucosterone test so you need to do oral glucosterone test annually insulin resistance is present in around 65 to 80 percent of women with pco independent of obesity as it is further exacerbated by excess weight PCO is classified as non-modifiable risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is the major cardiovascular risk factor and life style therapy has been shown to prevent or delay progression to type 2 diabetes. Use of hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 or greater has been proposed for diagnosis of diabetes. So what are the risk of developing sleep apnea in women with PCO? So sleep apnea is an important long term consequence in case of PCO. So Woman diagnosis What is the, the definition of sleep apnea syndrome? What does it mean by sleep apnea? So the definition of apnea cessation of airflow for at least 10 seconds. So this is the definition of apnea but the definition of sleep apnea syndrome is the meaning abnormal behavior or psychological event occurred during sleeping. So any abnormal behavior or psychological event occurred during sleeping, this is mean sleep apnea syndrome. So women diagnosis with PCO should be asked or their parents ask it about the snoring and daytime fatigue and so known as inform it of the possible risk of sleep apnea and over it investigation and treatment when necessary. So BCO is associated with up to three fold high risk of obstructive sleep apnea. So it's a high risk. So it's about three fold high risk of obstructive sleep apnea. And nine fold increase in excessive daytime sleepiness. So it is so it's very important to looking for the risk of developing sleep apnea in patient with PCO. <laughs> so the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea is increased in obese women with PCO. So also the obesity is the risk factor for sleep apnea besides the PCO. So the patient if BCO and obese, this is high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. What is the risk of developing cardiovascular disease in women with PCO? So clinicians need to be aware that is a conventional cardiovascular risk calculators have not been validated in women with PCO. So meta-analysis shows that in the woman with PCO, the risk of coronary vascular, cardiovascular disease and stroke is doubled in patients with PCO. So this is according to top guideline. So sorry for talk article 2018. All women with PCO, should be assessed for cardiovascular disease risk by assessing individual cardiovascular risk factors. Obesity, like obesity, lack of 
physical activity, cigarette smoking, family history of type 2 diabetes, a dyslipidemia, hypertension, impaired glucosterone test, type 2 diabetes as the time of initial diagnosis. Cardiovascular disease remains one of the leading causes of death in women. So, women with PCO should be assessed for obesity, with PMI, and the waist circumference. So, this is very important here to assess the risk of cardiovascular disease because this cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of this in BCO. So we should assess any patient with BCO, assess the patient's obesity with PMI. So you do, you do PMI and so waist circumference. So this is the SPA question came in exam. What is the risk of having reduced health related quality of life in women with PCO. So psychological issues should be considered in all women with PCO. And depression and anxiety should be routinely screened for and present assessed. So the patient with PCO should look for the psychological problem, screening for depression and anxiety. In women with PCO, positive or screening, further assessment and appropriate counseling and intervention should be offered by qualified professional. So what is the relationship between the cancer and BCO? So cancer and BCO, oligo or immunary in women with PCO may be exposed to endometrial hyperplasia and later is carcinoma. So it is this risk of endometrial hyperplasia and maybe lead to this uh, carcinoma. So there is risk of endometrial carcinoma. In a good practice, recommend treatment with, with genes to induce withdrawal bleed at least every three to four months. And the transfer ultrasound should be considered in absence of withdrawal bleed or abnormal trial bleed. In BCO, individual thickness of less than seven millimeters is unlikely to, to be hyperplasia. So here's the cut point here in endometrial sickness in the, in the three minibosa is about seven millimeters. So if less than seven millimeter, so no need for unlikely to be hyperplasia. A secret endometrium or endometrial polyps should promote consideration of endometrial biopsy and or hysteroscopy. So if this patient have PCO and this skin endometrium, so and the endometrial polyps should be investigated by endometrial biopsy and or hysteroscopy. Because the PCO is associated with increased likelihood of the endometrial cancer and the Endometrial sickness cut is uh, about four in postmenopausal and seven about in the perimenopausal. Women with PCO have 2.89 fold increase for endometrial cancer. In women with PCO, interval between the menstruation of more than three months corresponding to fewer than four period of years, each years. So many be associated with endometrial hyperplasia. A regular induction of withdrawal bleed with cyclic estrogens and estrogens for at least 12 days, oral contraceptive pills or endometrial protection can buy 
to worship to the estrogens by device such as Marina would be advisable on in oligomenetic woman with PCO. So this is how to manage patient present with oligomenorrhea. So women with BCO do not have a significant increase in the risk of developing breast cancer compared to those with BCO. So here, yeah, no, no increased risk of breast cancer. So what is the strategies to reduce the risk or to reduction of the risk? So this is how to manage the patient with PCO. So this is the first slide is the exercise and weight control, it's lifestyle management. It's recommended that the lifestyle management of changes including diet, exercise, weight loss are initiated as the first line of treatment for women with PCO for improvement of long-term outcome and should see and or accompany pharmacological treatment. So this is the first line is to like style change. The life management, lifestyle management, including diet, exercise, and weight loss is recommended as the first line for treatment for women with PCO. So this is the first line for treatment. In women with PCO and excess weight, a reduction of the little as 5%, of total body weight have been shown to reduce the insulin resistance. So can reduce, uh, if you uh, decrease insulin resistance, you can decrease hyperinsulinemia. So they decrease the effect of insulin growth factor one on the ovaries. So testosterone levels are well are improving body composition as cardiovascular risk marker. So here, yeah, this is good advice to reduction of 50% of total body weight. Lifestyle management, targeting weight loss in women with BMI more than of BMI of 25 kilometers per meter square or more, which is overweight, and prevention of weight gain in women with was not overweight, 18.5 to 24.9 kilogram meter square should include post reduced dietary energy caloric intake and exercise so women so what is the indication of bariatric surgery so here there's two indication if women who have failed to lose weight with lifestyle strategies and who have body mass index is 40 kilogram meter square. So this is the indication for bariatric surgery. If the patient health follows her weight with lifestyle strategies and the BMI is 40 or more, this is the indication for bariatric surgery. Or the patient felt to lose weight with lifestyle strategies and the patient have PMI which is about 35 kilogram per meter square or more with high risk obesity related condition if associated with the high risk obesity related condition such as hypertension diabetes should be considered for bariatric surgery these two conditions sorry this is the two condition This is the two condition for bariatric surgery. This is the question. Give an exam. If health to lose weight with lifestyle strategies and the BMI more than the 40 or more, this is the indication. Or the patient felt to lose her weight with lifestyle and BMI is normal with other risk factor 
obesity related conditions such as hypertension type 2 this is also indication for bariatric syndrome drug therapy appropriate for long term management of women with pco to achieve this cystitis agent have not been licensed in the uk for use in patient with zawa diabetes so this the indication for insulin cystitis agent if the patient have pco and diabetes so Use of weight reduction drugs may be helpful in reducing hyperantrogenemia. There is evidence that metformin may modestly reduce androgen level by around 11% in women with PCO compared with placebo. Metformin can be considered in women with PCO who are already undergoing lifestyle management and do not and do not have improvement in impaired gelocosterone test and in those women with impaired gelocosterone. So though this is the indication of the all indication of metformin in patient with PCO. All start in to use a small weight reduction and improve by chemical hyperandrogenemia, but without changing gelocose insulin in stasis or lipid parents. So it is or start only affect the weight reduction and improve biochemical hyperandrogenism. So this is all about the long-term consequence of ballistic ovary syndrome. So question one. Excuse me, I think, see? Hello. Uh, excuse me, I can answer. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome is a common condition with many long term consequences. Which of the following is not one of the risks of polycystic ovarian syndrome? Endometrial cancer, hypertension, ovarian cancer, sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes. I think, see. Yes, excellent. So ovarian cancer is not a risky factor for BCO. Okay. Okay, thanks. The next question. Uh, ovarian uh, patient with a polycystic ovary syndrome and suffering from obstructive sleep apnea. Ask about the long-term effect. Uh, effect. Cardiovascular disease, dementia, respiratory acidosis, type 2, diabetes mellitus type 2, respiratory failure. So is that I think question it, two is what about uh, diabetes? Yeah, diabetes two is high risk of the patient associated with the uh, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. So it is exactly mm -hmm. okay. Excellent, Dr. Salma. Thank you so much. Type sense. Question three. Dr. Zubaida. Yes, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, Dr. Zubaida, uh, in a patient with PCO. Uh, with increase in insulin resistance, increase the risk of which of the disease? Uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes mellitus, the dementia, obstructive sleep apnea. The increase insulin resistance. So, um, increase resistance? Any risk of? <laughs> diabetes. Yeah. Uh, what about Sleep apnea because here hyperinsulinemia uh -huh. is the risk of yeah. obstetric sleep apnea. Also, can okay. increase, but say significant here is related to the obstructive sleep apnea. So, this is related more to the hyperinsulinemia. The next question. Okay. 
answer is obstructive learning. طيب okay. Yes. Uh, 38 years old women who is uh, known to have a polycystic ovary syndrome is seen in clinic, clinic with nine months uh, amenorrhea. Transvaginal ultrasound scan shows six millimeter thick, uh, thick but regular uh, endometrium. What recommendation would uh, be offered for the patient? She is PCO uh, for nine months amenorrhea and uh, endometrial yes. thickness six millimeter. Uh, so. Comments for progesterone, comments for combined or progesterone, hysterectomy, complication of endometrial uh, Comments uh, on progesterone. Yes, excellent. So this uh, is the A, the uh, best answer. Okay. Uh, answer is A, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Amtan. Dr. Amtan. Dr. Amaha. وعليكم السلام والرحمة. عليكم السلام دكتورة ما. يا هلا الله يخليك تسلم. ويكم. ويكم دكتور. A polycystic ovary syndrome is considered the most common endocrine condition affected women of the reproductive age. What is the estimated prevalence? of the condition in this uh, age group. Yes, what was the incidence according to the article? Yes. Uh, 10, yes. To 15, 10 to 15. Yes, excellent. Yeah, 10 to 15, this is the incidence. Okay, next question. Uh, what is the best predictor of cardiovascular risk? In a 35-37 years old women who had diagnosed with PCO, uh, yes. body mass yes. and uh, waist circumference. Mm. Yes, here ask about the best predictor. Mm. We have two: obesity and waist circumference. Okay, but instead of asking about the best predictor, you should choose waist. Okay. okay. Because okay. this is the best predictor for the cardiovascular risk. This is according to the green top guideline. And this is the question can, uh, can also in exam. Recall question. The last okay. uh, the question of the uh, What proportion of an unavulatory infertility is uh, account by BCO? So the incidence mm. of the Proportion of the fertility is. I don't know. Yes. About 80 to 90 percent. Yes, excellent. This is between 80 up to 90 percent. That's an ability okay. in patient with the evidence. Thank you so much. Yes, that's my dear. Tarantinan. Yes, Doctor. Welcome, Dr. Tarantinan. Uh, actually, I am in the duty, but I will uh, try. Oh. To solve. Okay, sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, for each of the following questions, uh, choose the most appropriate management option from the list. Yes, okay. Okay, you can do only one question. Uh, a 13 year old girl is uh, brought to the gynecology OBD by her mother. Uh, she attend, uh, uh, attend a menarch a year ago, but has had only two cycles in the year. She, uh, uh, she weighs 48 kg. Her BMI is uh, normal. The mother is uh, concerned as she has polycystic ovary syndrome. 
she had uh, just two cycles per year and uh, she's 13 years. Okay, we'll see the options. Mm, uh, just reassurance because uh, in the yani in the start there is yani yes. not regular the cycle Excellent. reassurance yes just here for reassurance thank you doctor yes. thank you welcome bye welcome bye dr bujbe dr bujbe hello yeah hello i'll take Question number two, a 24 year old woman presents with a gynae OPD with the irregular periods. She has a six months history of amenorrhea. Her periods have been regular for the last two years. She is not in a relationship currently. She has been advised weight loss by the GP and is trying to maintain a healthy diet and active lifestyle. Okay, so six months history. So maybe progesterone. Yeah. Yes. Comments on progesterone. Sir. I regular withdrawal bleeding. I. Yes, I. This is the best answer for this patient. The last question. A 35 year old, yeah, question number three. A 35 year old woman with a BMI of 22 presents to fertility clinic. She has irregular cycle once in two to three months and is anxious to conceive. Her ultrasound reveals polycystic ovaries. Can I see the options? Maybe ovulation induction yes. or. AFR. There's no option of ovulation induction. Is it ovarian drilling? I don't know. There's nothing else. Ovarian drilling, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no other yes, option actually ovarian. going with it. Yes. Okay. Doctor, uh, can I ask Love. why 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 not the trial of metformin here in that question? Her well, BMI is, is only 22. No LH hyper secretion also. Yes. Is it only because of the BMI? Generally, I think what I understand, Dr. Vasan, like uh, whenever there is high BMI plus uh, uh, in, uh, like uh, LH hyper secretion, then the trial of uh, metformin, like or if there is any borderline sugars, this is what is my understanding. Is it right, Dr. Fat, or is there anything else? BMI is there if there is any patient have diabetes. Okay, you can do metformin. Okay. Okay. Okay, can... okay. A 32 year old Paris woman presents to gynae or clinic as she is unable to lose weight. She was diagnosed with PCOS, uh, PCOS, uh, but she has uh, never had any menstrual irregularity. So maybe the anti obesity in case, drug oh, or any start something. Sorry, Dr. Bushby. Uh, yes. for me should be restricted to non-obese woman with BCO, uh, BMI less than 30. Less than 30, is no. it, doctor? OK. If the, if the, if the more said, sorry, if the uh, BMI is less than 30, OK, sorry. OK, OK. So here, the answer should be metformin or uh, the ovarian drilling, as per Dr. Vasan. Yes. Because here also BMI is 22 only. Yes. Here is the need for oral treatment. Like so she is right. Dr. Vasan is right. It should. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we need justification. Civilization. Here, okay. So or is option. As well uh, yeah. Weight loss medication such as or start may be helpful in people. You know, the lifestyle measurement have not been of help. This is the answer E. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, see you, inshallah, in the Saturday. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vasan. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vasan. Thank you, Dr. Vasan.
ஆ தேங்க் யூ டாக்டர் ஃபைவ்